Dear colleagues, this is my great pleasure to uh, uh, start the last session of this uh, meeting. This is the session which will be composed of uh, case reports from Romania and from Poland. And I would like to introduce my co-moderator and a very good colleague, Professor Horia Stanza from Romania, who is the uh, not only moderator, but also local co-organizer of this session and who will introduce to the Romanian case reports. Please, Horia. Thank you, dear Professor Jibowski. It's a great honor to be in this meeting and congratulations for your work. It's a fantastic meeting and all the ophthalmologists from Romania, I'm sure that they are delighted to attend these uh, informations, uh, very practical and uh, very new. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, the first um, paper, which is about uh, a case which I treated several years before. And I would like the technical staff uh, to uh, press on play for the recorded uh, presentation, please. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to this prestigious, prestigious event. Thank you very much, Professor Jigowski. Also, thank you, Professor Stanka. Uh, I prepared for today, uh, in my opinion, interesting case regarding uh, multifocal choroiditis. What's the cause? Purpose of uh, my presentation is to present you a case of multifocal choroiditis in a patient with follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. It's about a female patient, 62 years old, with a decreased visual acuity in the right eye, which underwent a complete ophthalmologic examination. Our patient was diagnosed with thyroid carcinoma and underwent a near total thyroidectomy. And the histology revealed a diffuse follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma with massive fibrosis. Postoperative thyroid uh, iodine 131 ablation and suppressive therapy with levothyroxine was performed. After two years, a recurrence in the left lateral cervical lymph nodes has been found, for which a lateral neck dissection followed by external beam radiotherapy with cobalt 60 was performed in a total dose of 40 gray. Following the monitoring of our patient by determination of thyroglobulin and anti-thyroglobulin autoantibodies and iodine 131 diagnostic whole body scan, a PET scan was required. This scan revealed multiple lung, mediastinal, liver, and bone metastasis, as we see in the image on the right. One year after that, our patient presented with a decrease of visual acuity at the right eye. On the left, the ophthalmoscopic examination, which revealed three choroidal tumor nodules, well-defined, white, yellowish, and temporal to the macula. The fluorescein angiography revealed in the late phase three hyperfluorescent choroidal tumors surrounded by hyperfluorescent spot points. This scan ultrasonography showed a dome-shaped tumor nodal with inhomogeneous echostructure and high reflectivity. The OCT examination revealed the prominence of the retina areas of neuroepithelium uh, with high reflective spots in the subretinal space. In the discussions, of course, we were thinking finally at choroidal metastasis. Could it be? Choroidal metastases are the most frequent malignant disease of the uvea in adults. This prevalence of this intraocular metastasis is between 2.5 and 9.5 percent of patients with metastatic carcinomas. Uh, from point of view of origin of primary tumors of the ocular metastasis, in on the first place, breast carcinoma followed by lung carcinoma. Thyroid carcinoma is extremely rare, just about 0.5, 0.4%. Most of the ocular metastasis are not clinically detected and located posterior to the equator. 
The choroidal metastases are mostly unilateral and unique. From the ophthalmoscopic uh, point of view, they are nodular, less prominent, well-defined, or diffuse, and multilocular. The surface is smooth, uniform, with pigment migration or white, yellow, intensive refrigerant aggregates or more rare deposits of orange pigment. The tumor or the infiltration of the choroid is frequently more extensive than the ophthalmoscopically revealed tumor. Frequent localization is temporal, about 35% of cases, like in our case, and superior, about 22% of the cases. To be mentioned in our case, the triple nodular, nodular metastasis aspect with the, um, which uh, pleads uh, uh, for a mechanism of metastasis through the bloodstream by dispersion of a metastatic uh, embolus in the choroidal vascular network. These uh, choroidal metastases from thyroid carcinoma are very rare, about uh, 20 uh, cases described in the literature, and they appear in the late stages of progressive thyroid metastatic disease. We see in uh, most of uh, um, the case reports, so was over 30 years after diagnosing diagnosing of the uh, thyroid carcinoma. In our case, it was about six years. Specific investigations for patients with thyroid carcinoma include serum thyroglobulin and anti-thyroglobulin autoantibodies, iodine 131 diagnostic whole body scan, and of course, the PET scan. Complementary examinations include fluorescein angiography, which is no, not specific uh, for this uh, metastasis, ICG, which is essential in, in the differential diagnosis. The metastasis appears opaque, avascular. Ultrasound in mode A, which uh, reveals the internal tumor reflectivity of the choroidal mass, and ultrasound in mode B, which reveals uniform tumoral mass, which same aspect for hemangioma, acromic melanoma, and choroidal metastasis. The CT has a limited contribution for the positive diagnosis, but important for the differentiation from osteoma and sclerochoroidal calcifications. MRI is highlighting tumors with a low captation of the contrast substance. And the OCT is not very useful for the histological differentiation of the tumor but shows, like in our case, the changes of the RPE and the neurosensitive, neurosensitive retina. Um, about differential diagnosis, uh, as I uh, re uh, mentioned before, the choroidal hemangioma is important to be discussed. We see it here on the right image. And uh, the choroidal melanoma with very, very specific aspect, and of course, choroidal osteoma. From the uh, point of view of evolution and complications, we can uh, have scleral invasion, Brooks membrane rupture, retinal hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, secondary glaucoma through mass effect. From the therapeutic point of view, we speak mostly about palliative treatments because the uh, average survival rate is about 12 months. In conclusion, in patients with thyroid carcinoma, we must perform periodic ocular examinations because uh, rare, but those complications are possible. So the diagnosis in our case uh, is multifocal choroidal metastasis from thyroid carcinoma. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you for inviting me to this prestigious event. Good morning, and thank you for uh, your kind invitation, Andrew. I would like to present a case of a 48 years old male, which presented in our clinic in November 2018 for a second opinion regarding the ophthalmological diagnosis. And the patient presented in both eyes, decrease of the visual acuity, floaters, and light sensitivity. Patient had a chronic hepatitis treated with interferon in the years before, 
and he presented no relevant family history of ocular or systemic diseases. In March 2017, the patient was diagnosed with bilateral anterior and intermediate uveitis and was treated with corticosteroids, anti-infective therapy with trimetoprim sulfamatoxazole, azithromycin and clindamycin, and the patient had received three intravitreal injections of triamcinolone without any significant clinical improvement. At presentation in our clinic, the patient had a poor visual acuity counting fingers in his both eyes, intraocular pressure was normal, and the slit lamp examination revealed just mild anterior uveitis signs with a few cells in the anterior chamber and two plus tendal sign, and a dense vitreous behind the lens. The ultrasound revealed hyperreflective echoes in the posterior cavity in both eyes. And the lab tests were normal or negative except the quantiferon TB GO test, which was intense positive. We presume the diagnosis of both eyes, intraocular tuberculosis with panuviitis and complicated cataract. We need to collaborate with a pulmonologist in order to set the proper treatment. So the first pulmonologist considered only the normal chest X-ray for the patient and did not prescribe any kind of treatment for this case. We were disappointed and asked for the second opinion, which fortunately consider the IGRA test intense positive as a marker to prescribe the anti-TB therapy and the standard treatment according with the recommendation of World Health Organization uh, were prescribed with four drugs for the first eight weeks and two drugs for the next 18 weeks. And we noticed a remission of uveitis after initiating anti-TB treatment. Having a remitted anterior uveitis, we performed the cataract extraction by phacoemulsification in the left eye with a good recovery, the procedure itself was a little bit more difficult than a routine one because we had to stain the anterior capsule and the cortex was very adherent to the entire bag, but we succeeded to implant a posterior chamber intraocular lens into the bag. The visual acuity was 2040, and one month after, because the inflammation was not exacerbated, we <clears throat> performed a pars plana vitrectomy, trying to diagnose, to take some samples from the vitreous in order to diagnose better the disease and to treat all the uh, opacities of the vitreous and the retinal adherences. We need to stain with triamcinolone the vitreous and we carefully dissected all these adherences which were very strong connected with the retina in the macular region. The visual acuity was excellent after the pars plana vitrectomy, the patient having a 20-20 vision and a good retinal contour, as you can see. But we had to consider also the treatment of the right eye. Unfortunately, the pandemia started and the patient was able 
to come back again in our clinic only after four months when we had the same stepwise approach performing the cataract surgery in the right eye with a good improvement to 2030, but with uh, still having vitreous opacities, very disturbing. We performed after one month the parspana vitrectomy and the recovery was as excellent as in the left eye, the patient presenting 2020 visual acuity in the both eyes. The recently proposed guidelines for the diagnosis of uh, TBUVitis encompass exclusion of other known etiologies of uveitis, suggestive clinical history and signs, supportive investigations such as positive man two tests, chest radiograph findings, and IGRA tests. And also the response to anti-TB therapy is very important. Our take-home messages are that the clinicians should be aware of the possibility of intraocular TB and perform an appropriate diagnostic workout. Our surgical efforts as ophthalmologists could not be successful at all without a proper medical treatment of the disease itself. Our final diagnosis is both eyes complicated cataract and intermediate uveitis of PB etiology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Horia, for the great uh, presentation. And now this is my pleasure to introduce our Polish uh, speakers. The first is Dr. Agnieszka kudasiewicz kardaszewska who represents the uh, one of the best uh, Polish private ophthalmology centers uh, founded by Professor Zbigniew Zaguski, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, Polish best ophthalmologists and person I, I respect very much. And the co-author of this paper is also Professor Ferenc Kuhn, internationally recognized expert in trauma cases. So please, uh, let's listen to this uh, uh, case presentation now. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present a case of old post-traumatic uveal prolapse 10 years after a contusion and its surgical management. Our patient was a 67-year-old female who was referred to the clinic due to the foreign body sensation and discomfort aggravated during linking. She had a past history of contusion, fist hit, 10 years before. Best corrected visual acuity in that eye was 0.1, uh, intraocular pressure 28, so elevated. Slit lamp examination revealed superiorly an uveal bulging with a lack of sclera above the limbus, three clock hours long. The pupil was dragged superiorly and the upper iris involved in that prolapse. The patient was scheduled for surgical treatment due to the discomfort and imminent perforation. We uh, decided to carefully dissect the conjunctiva covering the uveal prolapse. Uh, the uvea was diatomized ab externo and pars plana core vitrectomy was done. Since there was lack of the sclera in the area of prolapse, the diatomized area was covered by donor sclera ordered from the tissue bank and sutured with single interrupted 10 nylon sutures and patient's own conjunctiva, conjunctiva was advanced from above and fixed with 7 o uh, vicral sutures to the limbus. This is the post-operative appearance, seven days Postoperatively, scleral transplant was fully covered with patient's own conjunctiva, slightly hyperemic, and two months postoperatively, ocular surface was quiet and almost completely restored. The operation resulted in quick relief of symptoms and stabilization of the local anatomical appearance, which remains stable in six months follow-up. Uh, in uh, one month 
After operation, the steroid antibiotic drops and beta blockers were used, uh, but after that time, no medications were needed. This is the patient's uh, ocular surface is six months after operation. And in conclusion, diatomy ab externa with donor sclera transplantation seems to be an effective treatment of old post-traumatic uveal prolapse. This type of surgery serves also for strengthening of the weak eye wall. Thank you for your attention and I would like to uh, give my special thanks for organizers, especially Professor Krzybowski, for invitation to that meeting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Uh, Monika Wazicka Gawetska, who uh, present uh, the last case report for our at our conference today. Please. Uh, hello, very nice to meet you all. So I would like to present a case of 66 year old man uh, with truly no uh, previous ophthalmic history, generally almost healthy except for hypertension and hypothyroidism. What's important in October last year, patient uh, had really severe COVID-19 pneumonia, which required uh, four weeks of mechanical ventilation. And just after a discharge from uh, ECU, uh, patient um, complained uh, for uh, for worsening of the visual acuity in the right eye, uh, which uh, and two weeks later uh, also noticed uh, the changes in the left eye because the patient um, condition was still unstable. Uh, he was only able to be consult, um, consulted by uh, the um, uh, ophthalmologist uh, in that hospital. Uh, so the patient the, 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 was diagnosed with bilateral uh, radiocyclitis and uh, the treatment of uh, phosphate dexamethasone was initiated. But unfortunately, despite the treatment, patient didn't improve uh, and even um, noticed um, further deterioration of the vision in both eyes. So finally, at the end of uh, December last year, a uh, patient condition allowed for a uh, detailed examination in our clinic. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what patient uh, present uh, at the initial uh, visit. Uh, well, there was the um, decreased visual acuity for far in both eyes, especially in the right eye, uh, accompanied by um, decreased uh, visual acuity for near in the right eye. Uh, intracular pressure was normal in the left eye, but in the right eye it was uh, significantly increased. Uh, both eyes uh, had ciliary conjunctival in, uh, injection. There were typical changes for uh, for uveitis, so uh, they were KPs, but they were very very specific type KPs because those those were stellate KPs uh, which were distributed all over the cornea, so they were not restricted to the art triangle. Uh, what also was was very distinct was uh, that patient had endothelitis in both eyes, much more pronounced in the right eye, uh, in which we also observe corneal edema. Uh, there were no posterior or anterior snakias present. Uh, we are lucky because in our clinic we also have the laser photoflarimetry. Uh, for those who are not familiar, it's like the device which uh, allows for a kind of objective um, uh, accession of the anterior chamber reaction. It's very good for follow up the patient. In normal patient, it should be under 10. In this patient, it was significantly increased with typical for inflammation uh, dome shape. Um, well, there were no changes in the pupil. As I said, there were no uh, no, 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 no synechias. We just observed slight uh, worse medriasis in the right eye. Uh, well, there was very slight stromal inferior atrophy in the right eye. Uh, well, of course, uh, there were typical quite uh, significant uh, inflammatory reaction in the anterior chamber which was assessed according to the sun classification. Uh, in the right eye was also like a very slight uh, vitreous reaction in the anterior chamber, but it looked more like a spill out from anterior segment than the primary inflammatory process. 
fundoscopy of the left eye was completely normal, but in the right eye, uh, there was papilla and macular edema. So that's how our patient looked like. I know that in here you mostly see the uh, the changes in the uh, art triangle, but it's very difficult to take a good picture of those small stellate KPs. But believe me, they were distributed all over the cornea. Uh, so uh, because we were dealing with granulomatous uh, hypertensive uh, um, anterior uveitis, so we could exclude all the uh, causes of, of course, uh, non-granulomatous um, uh, uveitis like uh, HLB27 related uh, um, uh, uveitis. Uh, from those which are hypertensive, as you remember, most cases of uh, anterior uveitis are associated with low or normal uh, intraocular pressure. And here we were dealing with the increased intraocular pressure. So there are just few uh, possibilities. We exclude right away sarcoidosis because the KPs look completely different. They are muton fat and uh, restricted to the art triangle. So mostly we were thinking that our differential diagnosis include uh, Fox uveitis which was really not very probable, and um, herp herpetic uveitis. So uh, actually for Fuchs uveitis, we just had few arguments like uh, um, increased intraocular pressure and uh, the appearance of the KPs, but otherwise most of the uh, patient factors didn't fit to that uh, uh, diagnosis. So well, we hypothesized that we are, uh, we are dealing with... Um, herpetic one, but in here you have to differentiate between CMV uh, infection and, and herpes simplex varicella zoster infection because they are treated with different antiviral drugs. Uh, so, uh, well, generally mm, there were much more factors uh, typical for CMV uh, uveitis because in um, uh, herpes simplex uh, uh, anterior uveitis, you, you have different type of KPs. They are usually like feather-like, more, more like mutant fat. They are, the, typically there is um, a huge uh, uh, tendency for um, synechia formation. Also what, what didn't fit, typically uh, this inflammatory reaction is as high that it leads to uh, development of uh, um, Hypopion, or even this type of candy cane hypopion with uh, high FEMA. So anyway, well, most of the of the of the of the of the uh, patient symptoms uh, were for uh, CMV uh, iridocyclitis. Uh, very pathognomonic was this endocells uh, endo uh, endo endotelitis, uh, which. Uh, could rarely happen in herpes simplex uveitis, but it's very rare. It, it, as, as I said before, it is even believed it's pathognomic for that type. The only thing which was against was that we we had the bilateral disease, but it's not. It was not that strong because the literature said that in 35 part five percent of patients actually uh, it's bilateral. So anyway. Uh, that was our hypothesis that we are actually dealing with CMV iridocyclitis. But of course, we performed the testing. Patient had the paracentesis. Uh, the sample were taken uh, for PCR against viruses. Uh, of course, we did the serological test. We knew that, uh, of course, the positive results doesn't uh, confirm diagnosis. But if they were negative, they rule out the diagnosis. Uh, I didn't mention that in here, but of course, patient was also tested against uh, TB and uh, Treponema pallidum, as they can I imitate all type of uh, uh, um, uh, uveitis. So anyway, we uh, before we get the results, we started empirical treatment, uh, oral valgan cyclovir, and 48 hours later, we... Um, also gave patient oral steroids uh, in the topical treatment, which is also very important in anterior uveitis. We just changed the phosphate, the dexamethasone, which is weak steroid for the more potent uh, alcoholic form. Uh, well, we gave tropicamide just twice daily because there was no tendency for synechias, uh, hyperosmolar drops for the uh, edema and uh, topical uh, anti-glaucoma drug. 
Uh, we got the results uh, very quickly, which uh, confirmed our initial diagnosis. They were positive for CMV. Uh, of course, the serological tests, as I said, they were positive for all kinds of viruses. But uh, what was um, interesting, they, they, would, they were highly, really highly positive uh, for uh, CMV uh, in EGG. So it means that we were dealing with the uh, reactivation of the latent CMV. So we ask ourselves question, is it possible that this kind of uh, infection was activated by recent uh, COVID-19? And we found lots of papers which says that uh, CMV uh, can uh, reactivate in uh, um, almost 30% of patients with severe cause and up to 45% of patients who underwent uh, mechanical uh, ventilation. Also, we were trying to find out if um, uh, if it is if really COVID-19 is associated with higher risk of developing or reactivating any kind of uveitis and we also find the confirmation in the papers. So finally the patient was diagnosed with bilateral um, CMV uh, iridocyclitis following uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, so two weeks after the treatment there was a really big improvement in almost all parameters. Uh, of of course, some slight uh, uh, trace of uh, inflammation was still present. Uh, well, you can see how nicely uh, CMO and papilloedema res resolved. Uh, so anyway, uh, of course, patient was left on the treatment with slowly tapering of steroids and we draw some of types of the drug. Anyway, two months after uh, the initial uh, presentation in our clinic, the patient was discharged to the outpatient clinic uh, because, well, most of the changes, uh, uh, well, the, there was a f almost, let's say, full remission. Uh, but of course, the patient was sent to with um, recommendation for the maintenance therapy, which included uh, val valgan cyclovir, which should be uh, retained for one year, uh, metaloprednisolone and uh, topical dexamethasone. And patient was scheduled for the uh, next visit in six months. And we were very surprised when the patient came back three weeks uh, after uh, our last visit in the clinic with the relapse of the anterior uveitis. Uh, it was very, the patient came uh, right away. So there were only changes in the anterior segment of the eye. And well, we were surprised because patients were doing really good. So we went through the patient therapy and we found out that the only changes which the local doctor made was actually change the topical steroid for the much less potent. And probably that was the reason. So anyway, we tried to not freak out and just uh, uh, not to, uh, we didn't um, elevate the um, oral prednisolone. We decided to give more frequently, but really potent uh, topical uh, steroid and we were successful two weeks later uh, we observed the remission so anyway i have to say that i also saw the patient like three weeks ago and he's still go doing good the next visit is uh, scheduled for um, january so i hope i will be able to um, remove almost all the drugs uh, and to sum up i just want to say that Traditionally, we believe that CMV uh, is associated with the retinal necrosis in immunocompromised patients. But we need to remember that actually the iridocyclitis is the most common ocular manifestation of CMV in immunocompetent patients. And uh, it can happen in patients with temporary decreased immunity. Uh, the clinical picture, as I said, is very typical with rising interocular pressure, those stellate uh, KPs distributed all over the cornea, endotelitis, no uh, tendency for uh, synechias, and poor uh, response for the anti-inflammatory treatment or acyclovir treatment. We need to remember that it should be treated promptly because otherwise, of course, it can lead to really severe complication. Well, and finally, we need to remember that COVID-19 uh, is associated with increased risk of reactivation and even developing all kinds of uveitis, not only CMV. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we have a time for discussion. And in the meantime, during the discussion, we will uh, present you the uh, possibility for voting. And uh, please vote for the best uh,
case report of the conference, it will be named the best paper of the conference. Well, so let's start the discussion. Uh, we can start with the first paper uh, about the uh, choroidal metastasis. And uh, well, in the meantime, I noticed that uh, Dr. Kadaszewska has a comment on that. So uh, Agnieszka, please, please share yeah. your, 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 your thoughts about that. I just, I just want to comment that it's very important to remember that metastasis may appear many years after initial diagnosis of the malignancy. Sometimes even patient cannot connect the signs and symptoms with the initial diagnosis. I remember in the beginning of my practice, we have once had a patient with a history of Hodgkin lymphoma with metastasis to the, to the choroid after 15 years of initial diagnosis. And in that time, he was considered to be cured. So that's that's the problem with the with the malignancies well i just i would i would i would like to just to say that well of course uh, as, uh, as dr agnieszka said that it can be many many years after the diagnosis but it can also be reversed so sometimes and we had this kind of patient where metastasis were the first uh, symptoms of the uh, of the um, uh, of, of the of cancer so uh, actually first we saw the changes in the choroid and later on uh, we started to uh, check up a patient for uh, all kind of uh, uh, things and we revealed, I believe, prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. I mean, different scenarios are possible. Yes, please, Horia. I, I would like also, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Mihna Montanu, my friend from Romania, who was the presenter of this case. He is the <laughs> chief of clinic in Victor Babes University in Timisoara. And uh, I also, uh, I would like to recognize the rarity of this kind of case because uh, thyroid cancer very rare is having uh, metastasis uh, in the choroid is uh, as uh, we could see in the literature there are just a few cases reported about uh, choroidal metastasis in the choroid uh, after a thyroid cancer yeah mm -hmm. I have a question actually to the second paper, if I may, about the tuberculosis and the treatment there. Did you consider maybe to do phacovitrectomy instead of doing staged treatment? Because it was a, an, expect, an expectation of flaring of the uveitis when you do the cataract. So you ended up doing fake vitrectomy anyway. So maybe it was an option to consider fake vitrectomy instead of doing it in stage. Although I am, may understand the rationale for doing it in stage. Yes. Um, I don't like to do fake vitrectomy usually. I'm doing a lot of macular surgery and I'm using uh, gas tamponide, uh, I don't like to have both uh, surgeries in the same time. And this situation was a little bit different because uh, I really didn't know too much about the visual prognosis after the surgery. So it was a stage approach because I wanted to have to, to check if the patient is uh, recovering something. And uh, uh, after I noted that uh, uh, the vitreous was uh, not so dense after the anti-TB treatment and uh, after I uh, removed the lens and the visual acuity improved a little bit to 2040, I uh, uh, took the next step to vitrectomy. So I, I may, obviously you could do both surgeries in the same time but uh, in this kind of inflammation, which was very difficult to control, I wanted to have a stepwise approach. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have... Yes, please. 
I have a comment for the second presentation because uh, well, uh, it was a very good presentation. I have to say that, as I said about uh, my paper about CMV, I have to say that also we see much more tuberculosis in the uh, in the pandemic pandemic area. I have my uveitis uh, outpatient clinic, and for the past I don't know. 10 years, I had maybe four or five cases of tuberculosis. And in the last six months, I have four. So it's mean that it's really, really uh, much more frequent uh, than it was previously. Yeah, and uh, if I can uh, make a, a joke, <laughs> uh, because the first approach was before pandemia, we were not able to perform PCR because we didn't have this kind of uh, uh, lab test in our hospital. But after the COVID came, <laughs> um, uh, came over us, we have a lot of machines to do PCR right now. So we are fully prepared to, to test the patients. <laughs> Yeah, but it's very interesting that there are not only pulmonary cases. I had two patients uh, with extra pulmonary location. One was in the central um, nervous system and the other was uh, in bones. So, well, very atypical uh, cases of uh, tuberculosis. In, in Romania, we were not uh, allowed to prescribe anti-TB treatment as ophthalmology. So, we need to have a pneumologist to prescribe this kind of treatment. And as I mentioned in my paper, it was a fight because the first pulmonologist rejected the, the diagnosis of uh, extra pulmonary TB just because the patient uh, didn't have a, a right image of the pulmonary involvement, an X-ray uh, with uh, mm -hmm. according with a TB disease. But it was uh, an ocular TB for sure, and the response to the treatment was uh, pretty eloquent. Thank you. And don't you, excuse me, don't you think that COVID infection make the organism so, some kind of um, compromised listening to B infections after or CMV infections because they were usually usually in immunocompromised patients. Maybe that's the clue. But as far as I understand, it happened before the pandemia. Uh -huh. my, my case was uh, before he had an ocular TB mm -hmm. in both eyes. Okay. Before the pandemia, the coronavirus just stopped the treatment for the other uh -huh. eye. Yeah, but I strongly believe that truly COVID-19, uh, especially those severe infection, may uh, like um, uh, do this kind of immunocompromised, let's say, stage in patient, and they really may uh, reactivate any kind of different latent diseases. For sure, I have the, the same uh, ideas. Well, we, we have w one more question from the audience. As a matter of fact, it's more commentary, but uh, this is, again, Horia, for your talk. Uh, and this is from Philippines, from Dr. Perfecto. For patients who had TPUVitis, it is suggested uh, that visual field and color vision testing to monitor the effects of anti-TB medications, especially etambutal toxicity. Yes, it's a good point. Uh, actually, I was so happy about the recovery of the visual acuity and the patient also that I didn't check this kind of ocular toxicity. And uh, honestly speaking, uh, the patient is very connected with uh, alcoholic abuse. And uh, if I uh, will uh, determine a kind of optic neuropathy, it could be also <laughs> alcoholic, not only due to etambutol, you know. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, we have uh, another uh, question and uh, commentary from the audience. We do get cases of cataracts for patients with post anti TB medications. Upon removal of cataracts, the vision is still poor since the optic nerve has been affected. So another comment on that. 
As uh, we could see uh, in uh, this case, uh, the recovery, the, actually I, I uh, examined the patient, that patient including today in the morning, and he is still, uh, he's still having a good evolution in his visual function. And uh, the last surgery was uh, in uh, August last year. Thank you. Do you have any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, I think uh, we can we can finish the discussion. And uh, well, uh, in the meantime, the voting uh, was conducted. I'm not sure if we have the results of the voting. If they are not uh, available, then uh, we will probably uh, mm, go into uh, the end of this uh, session and the conference. So I would like to thank very much uh, at first our speakers for the session and uh, Hoya, you as a co-moderator and uh, local co-organizer for uh, preparing the, the Romanian uh, input uh, to this to this uh, uh, meeting. Yes, we have the, I think we have the, the results and then uh, so well, uh, let me check uh, the the, uh, the the best uh, the best score was achieved by the paper from Thailand by Dr. Kasem Seri Kohson, uh, entitled "Bilateral Acute uh, Angle Cl Closure Crisis After COVID Vaccination." Uh, so congratulations to to the winner. It is it is the opinion by the audience. It's a very democratic opinion. People just vote. And we, we really uh, respect it, and of course uh, share the information with the with the authors as soon as possible if they are not uh, watching us. And they, this paper will be uh, named as the best paper of this of this conference. So uh, again, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, to all, all people who stayed with us so long. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.